Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Debatable with your hosts Nina and Kyle. I'm Kyle. I'm Nina and today we'll give a much needed update about COVID-19. It's been 500 plus days since the Philippines went into quarantine and it seems that things are changing but for us Filipinos who are at home, nothing has really changed since 2020. We're still in quarantine, the government still seems to be corrupt and nothing seems to be changing. So new variants now are popping up. News about vaccine efficiency is constantly being updated and new policies are being implemented every day to adjust to this new normal or this new life. So today, we'll talk about updates on the COVID-19 to update the old primer we had. We've done multiple episodes on this in the past. So this is just a refresher as well as an update on things you might not be aware about. And we'll tell you everything you need to know as we go through the second year of the pandemic. In particular, we'll be talking about the new variants that are popping up. Let's start it off with an explanation of what a variant even is. Because I was asked the other day, does the presence of a variant necessarily mean that the government has messed up? And the answer is a bit yes, a bit no. Because a variant of a virus, it's an expected occurrence. Because viruses change constantly through mutation. Basically, what happens is viruses are, you know, DNA. So whenever they replicate, there is a chance that in the replication process, something goes wrong. And when that thing happens, you know, you create a mutation. And that could possibly lead to a variant if you have multiple mutations being stacked on top of each other. So much so that it becomes completely, you know, a a new beast altogether like it's it's from the same virus but it's kind of significantly different for us to treat it as a variant so as a virus spreads it has new opportunities to change and may become difficult to stop so just because there's a variant doesn't necessarily mean that a government has messed up because it's a natural occurrence but the creation or the emergence of these different variants might be expedited because governments have failed to contain the virus. Mm. So the thing here is, the more people have it, the more it spreads, the more opportunities the virus has to make these mutations. And that's where it becomes a bit problematic. So these changes, though, can actually be monitored by comparing differences in physical traits. If you look at the... uh, If you take a look at the virus itself, there are lots of physical traits such as resistance to treatment or they can also look at the genetic code. So mutations as like, you know, every living person or every living thing, we do have a lot of mutations and you can actually look at it through changes or differences in our genetic codes. So that's how they compare those differences to monitor the development of new variants by comparing it to something else. And the CDC, or the Center for Disease Control, actually compares it to looking at a tree. If you think of a virus as a tree growing and branching out, each branch of the tree is slightly different from every other branch. So if you compare the branches, you can label them according to the differences. And these small differences, or variants, have been studied and identified since the beginning of the pandemic, COVID-19 in particular has been going through a lot of mutations since its first spread. And there are actually some surprising findings with regard to the variants front. Yeah, so while I was researching for this episode, I actually found out that at this point, the original variant that caused the initial COVID-19 case in January 2020, or even earlier, like the one that was first detected and the one that spread from China, it's no longer circulating since new variants have increased and actually taken its place. So we're now seeing different variants and not the initial one that used to exist. And you might be wondering why we haven't heard of other variant names besides Delta and Lambda. And the reason for that is the fact that scientists monitor all variants, but they only really flag those worthy of note. And they classify those as variants of concern, quote-unquote. And the reason that they are of concern is because there might be differences with how they spread, how severe their symptoms are, and how they could be treated. The other variants that are being monitored but are not of concern are just called variants of interest in the meantime. And obviously, those can change, right? Delta used to be a, a variant of interest before they researched on it more and then discovered, oh my gosh, 
it spreads way faster and therefore it's now a variant of concern. At the present time, an expert group convened by the WHO has recommended using letters of the Greek alphabet, so alpha, beta, gamma, delta, lambda, which makes it easier for a lot of people to understand. I was surprised because we are already at the delta and the lambda, so the first thing that I thought of was like, where's the alpha and the beta? So apparently, they, like, it's not that we've never heard of them, it's just that we've never heard of them being referred to as the alpha variant or the beta variant. So if you can recall, the other month, we've been talking about a variant first discovered in the United Kingdom. We've also seen a variant seen in Africa. We've also seen a Brazil variant. And those three variants, we've already discussed them before, or you might have heard of them before, but you probably know of them as the Brazilian variant, the African variant, rather than what we now know them as the alpha variant, beta variant, and gamma variant. So to be clear, the alpha variant is the one that we saw from the UK. The beta variant is the one that we saw from South Africa. The gamma variant is the one that was discovered in Brazil. The delta variant um, was first identified in India. The lambda variant was first identified in Peru. And you might be wondering what makes all of these things different. Like what, From what I know, alpha, beta, and gamma have slight differences in terms of their severity, but not really much difference in how they spread. So we're now talking about the delta one, which raised a really big flag for a lot of institutions because while it is a variant, it seems to be different from the rest, a little bit more severe than the rest because of how it spreads. So that's where we talk about now the delta variant, which is one of the main focuses of this episode. The variant is now the most common COVID-19 variant in the United States. It won't be soon before it's now the common one in the Philippines, based on the trends we have here. And it's nearly twice as contagious as earlier variants and might even cause more severe illness. The greatest risk of transmission is amongst unvaccinated people for this variant, much like the other variants. But I think the CDC wanted to really emphasize that unvaccinated people will really suffer the most under this Delta variant. Fully vaccinated people can have breakthrough infections accompanied by symptoms and can also spread the illness to others. So that's the issue now with vaccination in terms of the Delta variant. Because even if you're vaccinated, you can still be a carrier of this variant, much like earlier variants, but the spread is still going to be the same, right? So if we look at earlier variants, if you have a vaccine, the, the virus gets weaker. But here it just seems to be in hiding, which is why it raises a really big red flag for a lot of people. So this variant also might reduce the effectiveness of some monoclonal antibodies, um, which means like these are antibodies that replicate on its own, like in the body. And it also weakens antibodies generated by the COVID-19 vaccine. So even if you have a vaccine and you have antibodies because of that vaccine, the Delta variant can still weaken those, which might in the future require people to get more shots or boosters as people call them, right? So The Delta variant is still being explored. There's a lot of different things that we can still learn about it, but it is a big concern for many people. Yeah, actually, the CDC has described the Delta variant as more transmissible than even the common cold and influenza and even smallpox um, and MERS and SARS and Ebola. And it is as contagious as chickenpox, if I'm not mistaken. It was referred to that in one of their internal documents. So I feel like the thing about the transmissibility angle is that even, as you said, even if you are vaccinated, you can still transmit it, which means that, you know, there is a tendency for people to go like, oh, I'm vaccinated, I'm fully protected now, I will be a bit more carefree and I will use masks less often. You still should use masks. Um, You should still take all these precautions. And on the other hand, you see a lot of people going like, oh, if you're going to be able to get the Delta variant anyway, even if you're vaccinated why even get vaccinated and it's a whole thing because it's like like you can wear a a coat of armor right you can you can wear a lot of bulletproof vests but it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to survive a shooting but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't wear a bulletproof vest anymore yeah so if the issue is about vaccination then there's no reason not to get the vaccine, right? So a lot of authorities, especially in the United States, have still encouraged people to get a vaccine. It's still highly effective in preventing severe disease and death, including against the Delta variant, 
but it's not 100% effective. And some fully vaccinated people, as I mentioned, will still get infected through what is called breakthrough infections. But as I mentioned, you can still be a carrier and that's the bad thing. So still wear your mask. I feel like, and from what I know, a lot of countries that have high vaccination rates, they removed the requirement for masks already. But because of the rise of the Delta variant, they rescinded that and there was like, wear mask again, we're not yet safe. And the Delta variant is the main reason why. Yeah, but still, right, as you said, the vaccine still provides strong protection against illness and death, which means that even if you do get infected, that doesn't mean that it was useless for you to get the vaccine in the first place, Mm. right? It's like you might get a cold anyway. You might get the flu even if you have your flu shots. But because you had those shots, it's less likely to cause you any lasting damage. It's, you know, like flu used to be such a big deal and like lots of people would die from it. But because of people's flu shots, you know, the effects have been significantly decreased. But what about the Lambda variant? The World Health Organization classifies the Lambda variant as a variant of interest. So it's not a variant of concern yet. Uh, it's just, you know, we're interested in it. <laughs> Which was, uh, it was first, again, identified in Peru last December as laboratory studies showed that it has mutations that resist even vaccine-induced antibodies. So it does resist the, the vaccine, which is why it's a little bit scary. But we have to flag that this is basically speculation at this point. It's not yet known whether this new variant is more transmissible. And scientists say that the Lambda strain does carry a number of mutations that that could potentially lead to increased transmissibility or increased resistance to the antibodies provided by COVID-19 vaccinations or prior exposure to the virus. Researchers actually warn that with Lambda, uh, if you label it as a variant of interest rather than a variant of concern, people might not realize that it is a serious ongoing threat. So it is, at least should be treated like a variant of concern. But the reason why it's still labeled as a variant of interest is because there's not a lot of information available. So it's always a race against time, right? We have to research, but also make sure that people are vaccinated, but also make sure that we're classifying these viruses properly. So I think that what the scientific community calls it does not really matter to the regular person, the layperson. Mm. Because like, <laughs> if you tell a layperson, mm, did you know that this is... Uh, this did you know that this is a variant of interest and not a variant of concern? They'd be like, okay, but what's the difference? Yeah, fair, fair, fair. But, you know, a lot of anti-vaxxers have been using the, oh, it's a variant of interest. It's not a red flag yet. You'd be surprised. Like, in the United States, apparently, people don't see the variants as, like like reasons to get vaccination or to up their resistance. They just see variants as... Like inconveniences like oh it's just different but same same <laughs> we have to adapt to anti-vaxxers by just ignoring them just <laughs> <laughs> yeah at this point i feel like no matter what you say to anti-vaxxers they're not gonna believe you like they believe there's microchips or something or that it's gonna make you magnetic yeah i did hear that like th- there was a story about a woman and then her daughter died uh-huh. her daughter got hit by a car and then she was like i blame the vaccination what uh, because the vaccine had some heavy metals that made her more magnetic so that she attracted the car. What? That's so dumb, but so sad. I mean, like... A child died. I mean, a child died. It's sad. But to, for someone to be that delusional to blame a vaccine, it's, it's kind of just really sad. But yeah, anyway... It's pretty cool though. Like, if I would love to live in a world where, you know, the, active, the anti-vaxxers are correct. Like, I get a vaccine and then there's a microchip in it. And then I pull out the microchip and then you can reverse engineer and you can become like this tech mogul or something. What? Or <laughs> there are heavy metals in it and then you can control magnetism and then you... Surprise, you're Magneto now. I would love to live in a world, like, even supposing that the anti-vaxxers were correct. Yeah, give give me that vaccine. Give me that powers of magnetism. Yeah, but I guess we'll talk about multiple issues that come with the new variants. I feel like we've discussed a lot of these in the past, but nuancing, you know, it makes sense to talk about these issues again, especially since a lot has changed since... The first time we talked about COVID, which was what, like 2020? (laughs) Like I'm talking about it like it's so far away, but it's just last year. But it feels like a lifetime ago. And I guess the first issue here is to talk about the vaccine race. 
right? So this is new because the the first time we talked about COVID, like vaccines were not in sight at all, right? But but now they exist and scientists around the world are working faster than ever before to develop and produce vaccines that can stop the spread of COVID-19 or at least minimize its damage overall because we can't really stop a virus on its tracks. But we can slow it down until we develop like new technology and new medicine in order to adapt to it. And since the emergence of this novel coronavirus in 2019 of December, 20 vaccines actually have started to be rolled out in countries worldwide. So it's not just the ones we mentioned before. I forgot how many we mentioned, like five or six, but there's now over 20. And the reason why it's so important to get any kind of vaccine, it doesn't need to be the first five that were introduced to the world. But even the ones that are currently in development is because all vaccines are good vaccines, right? And obviously, they go through a lot of rigorous testing. And the reason why we need vaccines, as mentioned before in previous episodes, and as you've heard probably a lot of times in the news as well as in debates, is to achieve herd immunity, also known as population immunity. And it's an indirect protection from an infectious disease that happens when a population is immune either through vaccination or immunity developed through previous infection. So once you've been infected by COVID, you have a lower chance of getting COVID again, right? But given the new strains, you you still can get COVID again, which is why those who have gotten it before are still advised to be careful. But that's another issue altogether. So the WHO supports achieving herd immunity through vaccination, not by allowing a disease to spread through any segment of the population, as this would result in unnecessary cases and deaths, right? So there's there's a natural way to get herd immunity, which is like get everyone infected and then just survival of the fittest. But obviously no one wants that. This is the best rebuttal actually to anti-vaxxers because they keep referencing like oh we survived the plague right and we didn't need vaccines to do that you can just easily tell them yeah but one third of europe had to die for herd immunity to be naturally achieved and we're not willing to take that risk yeah did you know that before there would be stories about like just groups of mothers i don't know why mother i said mothers like the book said mothers but like groups of parents were like making their children have play dates um wherein all of them would get chicken pox like that that's the point of the play date like they, they should all get chicken pox as a chicken pox party so that they they could get this immunity while they're young and i remember just thinking wow that is a really weird way to deal with um chicken pox but anyway there is some good news on this front which is that cuba center for genetic engineering and biotechnology um has its own vaccine and you know there like there are several vaccines really um that are quite effective and have all been authorized for emergency use in their home countries um there are some in cuba there's some in taiwan and this just means that vaccine rollouts are starting to pick up speed especially in light of all the variants currently in place. So if we're talking about creating herd immunity through vaccination in the developing world, that seems to be more likely to happen as we see like more and more vaccines being created in these different countries. So you can see that, you know, the previous argument about how it's just for the developed countries like the European countries or the United States, you can kind of see that there is a shift towards it being more accessible even to you know less developed countries but at the same time there is bad news yeah a lot of research as mentioned are slowly getting outdated so it's a race right so even if you develop a vaccine new variants might be immune to that as the lambda has demonstrated so lambda for example is slowly learning how to gain immunity from the antibodies that are present in the vaccine as well as the antibodies that the body naturally develops so we're not sure yet what the future variants will look like So constantly, vaccines need to be updated and new ones need to constantly be made to win this race. Like, it's a hypothetical race. We're not sure if variants will be immune, especially since a lot of things are still unpredictable at this point, but it's still better safe than sorry, right? And we might actually even need a third dose, as a lot of people have been speculating. I know some people who get 13 shots. Like, there are memes on Twitter. Like, have you seen that meme of someone posting their, like, vaccine card? And they've had, like, 13 different shots. And that used to be joked about because they would say that you don't really need that many shots in order to gain the antibodies. But that might not be true, right? A lot of researchers are still looking into the possibility of maybe having boosters. 
or having updated Moderna shots in order to like combat the other variants that exist. Like in the United States, from what I heard, there are plans to have booster shots for people eight months after their second shot. So what would happen is starting... What I heard was that starting September um, or October, they would start rolling out booster shots. Mm. So that that might be a new thing. Like at the same time where you, you say that you might need a third shot, there is at the same time people saying, I'm sort of hesitant about getting the vaccine. Um, so there is still a concurrent problem with vaccine hesitancy and will the vaccines even be used? We discussed this in a completely different episode, uh, but the summary here is that you have misinformation, you have fear, you have general ignorance that caused a lot of people to shun the idea of using vaccines, which puts themselves and those around them in danger. And we have seen a lot of different debates about this. So let's discuss some of them. The first one would probably be about whether or not people who breach um, the health protocols, the lockdown requirements, while unknowingly infectious, should they be held liable for manslaughter and resulting deaths? And this is a bit, well, I wouldn't say tricky, but there are lots of different terminologies here that might be different from place to place. So the main one is manslaughter. We In the Philippines, we do not have this concept of manslaughter. Oh, really? Yeah, we don't have a concept of manslaughter. So manslaughter, we don't have it here because in the United States, it's punished as a completely separate thing. But here in the Philippines, if you killed another in a way that is less than murder, that would be considered manslaughter. So... Um, in the United States, if you are in a fit of rage or in the heat of passion or you're provoked and then you killed another person, that would be manslaughter. So basically, it is just like killing except it's not as intense as murder. That's the basic thing. So here in the Philippines, we do have a difference between murder and, for example, homicide. Homicide is just the act of killing another person. In order for it to become murder, you need to have some circumstances which we call qualifying circumstances Mm. that make it more intense that would make it into murder so um for example if you use poison if you evidently um planned it out before you carried out the killing those kinds of things if you if you use actually if you use the pandemic as a way of carrying out the crime that that could be considered murder like we were talking about in class how because of the pandemic there might be more murders what? not because like more people become murderers but because there are new circumstances that would make things that would ordinarily just be homicide or manslaughter and turn them into murders so one of the ways to turn homicide into murder is to take advantage of a calamity or a state of emergency Mm. right so that's what we were talking about in class actually like if you kill someone during the pandemic is that automatically a murder so that that's it's an interesting question right but that's not really the debate (laughs) you got you you went on a really long tangent there but you know i'll keep it in because it's still informative so i guess the debate now like going back to the motion is about something that is unplanned and unintentional which is if you accidentally infect someone with COVID because you chose not to be vaccinated and, for example, you didn't wear a mask and you ha- you're asymptomatic and you become a carrier and then someone gets infected and dies, it's whether or not we should consider that manslaughter. What's your personal take on it? Well, I mean, just from... <laughs> again, not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. But like from where I stand, um, I do sort of see that it could be manslaughter. Like, you didn't plan it, you didn't intend it, but you certainly did do something that caused the death of another. Whether that was voluntary or involuntary. That's the reason why it could be manslaughter. But, Again, that manslaughter talaga is such a confusing concept because we don't have it here. Um, so for me, the closest thing that you have here in the Philippines is homicide. But even with homicide, you there has to be some degree of planning. Um, you did have to. Well, you didn't plan it as in like planned it out like you wrote on a piece of paper the details of what you're gonna do. But there is some degree of intent. Like, you intended to do something. You intended to hurt someone. Mm. It just so happens that it resulted in a killing. So that's homicide. 
But here, we still do have this concept called criminal negligence, which is, again, not legal advice. But you do have this concept of criminal negligence where if you knew that you should have exercised a certain degree of care and then you failed to do that and it resulted in someone dying or someone getting hurt, you could be liable for that on a criminal level. So for me, like legally speaking, there is a way to make this motion in real, like happen in reality even without this motion, right? So like, you don't have to say, this is a new policy. You can say this is just an extension of policy that we already have. Interesting. For me though, it's difficult to crack down on who exactly is the cause. Like if you're all in the same party, right? And you are are a carrier and then someone gets infected and dies. Like how are we so sure it's you that caused it? Yeah, that's a problem. Can they trace that? Like I'm not sure the science behind it. Like I'm pretty sure you can't trace specifically who transmitted to you, right? Once it's in your system. Yeah, that that's the debate there, right? Because I'm saying that hypothetically, if you could prove it, then there is a way to, you know, make them liable for manslaughter if you could prove it. Mm. The problem is you need to show that this was the proximate cause of that death. Yeah. yeah. So that that that's the that's the place where it gets a bit tricky because hypothetically you could have something like this, but in reality you might as well not even recognize it because it's so hard to prove. That's fair. So that's the first motion. There's also a motion about deprioritizing the distribution of COVID nineteen vaccines, especially if those are people who contravene health protocols to begin with, like spreading false rumors about COVID, refusing to wear a mask. So this was from a tournament last 2020. Personally, I'm not a fan of this motion because for me, there's no point in refusing to give vaccines to people who don't believe that COVID is existent because they wouldn't take the vaccine either way. So it's not really a punishment, is it? Yeah, I feel like this was like a restatement of a much older debate. Like if you committed a crime, you shouldn't get like dialysis. If you engage in the illegal organ trade, you shouldn't get, you know, dialysis na naman. <laughs> you shouldn't get healthcare or something like that. Yeah. The idea here is you have scarce resources. So um, what is the best way to make sure that those resources are well spent? Uh, so in this case, basically what you're saying is if you are the type of person who doesn't want to wear a mask or if you intentionally or unintentionally spread misinformation about the vaccine or about the pandemic, then the consequence of that should be the state looking at you and going like, you are not the best use, uh, the the best person to allocate this scarce vaccine to Mm. because you are causing more harm than good. So we shouldn't reward you for doing that. So on one hand, you could argue it from a utilitarian perspective and say that these are the type of people who even with the vaccine, would still be likely to spread it because they don't wear masks, or they might get it because they don't wear masks, they might get the Delta variant, Um, but on the other hand, you can also look at it through um, a justice perspective where you go like, well, you broke the rules. This debate is really about choice and punishment, that kind of angle. But the other side to it would obviously argue that it doesn't matter if they believe it or not because we need to achieve herd immunity, right? So the the thing to combat the point of justice and fairness would be to talk about practicality. Like in a world where we are all dying, do we have time to decide who is worthy of a vaccine or not? As opposed to just giving it to as many people as possible, regardless of, of their beliefs. Like if they don't want the vaccine, I mean, if they don't believe in COVID but want to take the vaccine, we should take it as a win because that's one less person that can spread it regardless of if they feel or think it's fictional or not. Yeah, and you can even argue that, well, these are the people, these are precisely the people that you should vaccinate Mm. because they're precisely the people who are most likely to spread it to others because they don't wear masks. Yeah, so in terms of practicality, I feel like this debate is about principle and pragmatic. I feel like we've done these debates in the past, as you've mentioned. It's just taking on a new skin. Yeah, COVID skin. (laughs) The last one is this house as the state would not subsidize the medical expenses of a COVID-19 patient 
who previously refused to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, this was a motion that was brought up in a recent tournament that I judged in, which is the Philippine Law Debate Championship. Did you judge this round? Did you? Get- I didn't judge this particular round, but I was invited to judge the first few rounds of ah, okay. uh, this tournament. So, unfortunately, I don't have a handle on the legal arguments that people use in this in this motion because this was a legal mm. debate tournament. Um, but for me, when I look at this motion, um, again, it's it's the same as the previous motion where you made a choice: should you be punished for it, or should you be disadvantaged because of a. a I wouldn't say stupid because of a certain choice that you made. <laughs> um, so for me, like. It's the same issues, basically. It's the same idea of, is this the best use of the medical resources that we have? Because you did have the opportunity not to put yourself into this situation. But you said, I don't believe in that opportunity. I don't believe in this vaccine. Or you go like, I believe in this vaccine, but I don't believe in this particular vaccine. I'm just going to wait for another one. So there have been cases actually where people could have gotten vaccinated, but they didn't like the brand of the vaccine. And that's why they eventually died. Oh, damn. Yeah. So Where where did that happen? Is um, it a local issue? It is a local issue. Oof. Yeah. yeah it, it's someone that I, yeah oh no but okay, anyway sorry. yeah so that that's one of the things that you want to discourage with this motion that you know we want to help you it's just that we have to actively discourage you from making certain decisions as well that i feel like it's fair right i, I mean like my sentiments are similar to the previous motion Obviously, this is also a debate about principle versus practicality. This one just looks at medical expenses in general, not just related to... Uh, I, I feel like it's not just about the vaccine. It's also about what happens after you get that vaccine or after you don't get that vaccine in particular. I guess besides vaccine hesitancy, there's also an issue about vaccine availability. So in the Philippines, personally, I used to think that our main issue used to be vaccine hesitancy, right? We've made an entire episode about this. We looked at the statistics of like the surveys and what people thought. But I feel like that has changed. A lot of people now want to get the vaccines. It's just that it's not available to them. And you see people flocking to vaccination sites in hopes of getting a dose, even if it's just the first dose because they're that desperate. And last August 4 or 5, I'm not sure, but... It was a few days or the day before we went into quarantine again that there was a mall somewhere in Manila that was having a vaccination site um, set up and people flocked to it like in the middle of the night because news got spread around that, you know, people are giving vaccines here. Hurry up and get your shots before it's too late. And the police force said that usually like 1,000 to 2,000 people would show up. But on that particular day, almost 10,000 people were there, right? Or like at at first it was 3,000, which was already over capacity until it reached 10,000. And they had to like cancel the vaccination in that mall because the crowd was just too big and it might have made things worse. Yeah, so the question here is, is it still fair to place restrictions on people when government themselves are not able to provide the vaccines needed for them to gain access to these resources? That's the first thing. Another thing is, if you're going to impose like a community quarantine, should you do this and at the same time prevent people from getting vaccinated as well? Yeah, it's kind of dumb. <laughs> yeah, so like, um, because like I get it, I get it. But if I'm mistaken, that case happened because the rumor went out that if you are not vaccinated, you're not allowed to leave your house anymore. Yeah, so that was like a Duterte statement. Like, I feel like Duterte implied it. Well, Harry Rocker says Duterte implied it. I don't know who's telling the truth anymore. But basically, it was said that we're gonna, like, stop people who are unvaccinated from ever going out of their houses. There's gonna be a curfew for them, etc. So, assuming that was true, I mean, obviously, it's not true as we've seen and as implemented. But if that were true, I don't think it's fair, right? Because... You are telling people they can't go out when you yourself are not providing avenues for them to get the vaccination in the first place. So it's like you're punishing them twice just for existing in this particular country. Yeah, and the thing about that is you can say that, well, it's the law. eh? You have to apply the law like indifferently or you have to apply the rules to everyone regardless of their circumstance. 
But, uh, and here's the thing that I learned recently. The law only pretends to be fair. Like, on its face, it seems like it doesn't care about where you are in life. But as applied, it does expose a lot of inequalities. So, for example, uh, here in the Philippines, it's not actually legal for you to... Like, there was a point in time in the Philippines where it was illegal for you to be homeless. What? Yeah, so you go like, well, the law is completely fair because it applies to both rich and the poor. So we, the law punishes the rich and the poor alike for being homeless. <laughs> that's so dumb. <laughs> that's so dumb. Yeah, so that, that's the thing, right? Like on its face, it is neutral. But as applied, you do see that like statistically speaking, those people who are poor, who have less connections, they're less likely to get these vaccines. They're less likely to have the benefits of that vaccine. They're less likely to be able to go out because of where they are in life. And that's the thing, right? So last week, we talked about how some employers allegedly impose a no vaccine, no work uh, policy. And that's the that's the same thing, right? Should that be allowed if the employer does not give opportunities for their employees to be vaccinated? Um, those kinds of things. So I feel like there's multiple issues that can be discussed here. But it's basically about fairness. It's basically about accountability. And it's about who should bear the brunt of the new quarantine of the new lockdown of the vaccines and whether or not people get them and i don't think the people should be responsible for trying to procure their own vaccines at this point especially since the reason why we're still in this mess is because of multiple government failures and missteps for example when we get locked down which is our next issue because from what i know and since the pandemic started it seems that we always do lockdowns a little bit too late and we never seem to learn our lesson especially with new strains popping up and popping into our country there are even now literal memes that say we will only close the doors once the robbers get into our house and stuff because that seems to be what the government is doing like they haven't locked down when the uk variant was a thing they didn't lock down when the indian variant was a thing and now we have lambda variant from peru and we discovered our first case a few days days ago and that's the only time when the government considered locking down that it's already inside right so it makes no sense to me yeah so i i feel like you have to compare this to what happened in new zealand where just today right yeah where they saw just one new case of covid and they were like immediately let's lock down yeah yeah that was, that was great and not only did they lock down it was also because they had measures like they they would go give like um things to people like food they would get people tested so it's not just about locking down places it's about making sure you make that lockdown productive as a government and that's the other issue we have here yeah because there is some good news here which is that having a lockdown is not completely bad in and of itself like the the world health organization said that at some points countries have had no choice but to issue stay-at-home orders other measures like lockdowns in order to buy time so it's really important to note that no matter what you do on the lockdown front it will not solve the pandemic right the purpose of it is to buy time by lessening um the spread the spread those kinds of things so governments must make the most of this extra time that was granted by the lockdown to build their capacity to detect, to isolate, to test, care for all to care for all these cases, um, to trace, to quarantine, uh, contacts, engage, you know, those kinds of stuff. But like you, you need to take a look at these are the things that should have been prioritized and compare it to what's happening in your own country. Is that really the priority here? So there's bad news, at least for Filipinos, because the good news seems to only apply to countries like New Zealand. But in the Philippines, right, measures like this have seen to have profound impacts on individuals, communities, and societies in a bad way because of the fact that it brings social and economic life to a near stop. Like, malls are shut down, businesses are being ruined, and such measures like lockdowns disproportionately affect disadvantaged groups, including people in poverty, migrants, internally displaced people, even refugees, who most often live in overcrowded and under-resourced settings. And their daily lives depend on things operating as normal, but that doesn't seem to be the case, especially if you go into lockdown and your governments are not like making up for what is lost during that time. Yeah, so one of the things that 
we are talking about recently is whether you should still continue with online education post COVID nineteen. Worlds actually the the finals of I think Masters Cup was about whether or not you should still have online tournaments mm. after the pandemic and like. It was a funny we, we won that. We won that. Yeah, I mean, the Philippines <laughs> not, not won that. Not we, yeah. But the Philippines won that on government because they were arguing that, like, we're talking about opportunities to access certain things. So, with this first motion about universities continuing with online education after COVID-19, one of the issues there is safety. Definitely safety. So, like, you should you don't want to have a resurgence of COVID-19 because of those kinds of things. But also... Another question here is, does it make it more accessible for people? Yeah, but you could also respond to that by saying that while it is accessible in theory, it might not be accessible in practice because the livelihoods of these families that put their children to school end up being halted. So I can't even afford an online education, especially example in countries like the Philippines where Ateneos, um, sorry Ateneo, I'm calling you out here. If my brother goes there, your 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 fees and tuitions have not gone down. So it just makes it difficult, especially since my mom has had to like pause working for a bit because of lockdown in the United States and stuff. So there there seems to be a trade-off here, right? So while yeah. safety is achieved, safety for whom? Yeah, and <laughs> since you're calling out Atenea, like, San Beda. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> when when the pandemic started, not only did tuition not go down it actually increased like what <laughs> like what were they paying for i have no clue but anyway yeah so that that's the thing like and we have to nuance it to lockdowns um if we're viewing this as like a huge system where all of these measures try to complement each other so it's not just online learning per se it's not just lockdowns per se they're all connected right so you should take a look at how it is boosted by a lockdown or how it uh, it's affected or not affected by a lockdown so there are lots of like overlaps here that you need to take a look at another thing that we can look at is a motion from last year's VITDT round robin which is this house supports the US federal or state governments reopening of their economies yeah this is obviously like when you see it now it doesn't seem to be balanced right but at the time it was balanced because there was a lull well not really a lull what you call like the downturn of covid cases in the united states like they were done with their first wave by the time the tournament happened so it was a question now of it seems relatively safer do we like regenerate again income for people do we open up the economy again and at that point in time it made sense right and it's a constant debate here in the philippines as well because we seem to be going back and forth between lockdowns and opening malls and closing malls and allowing small businesses to thrive etc and it seems to be always related to the context for example in the philippines this motion might not be applicable to Manila, but in a lot of different provinces, it might be because their cases are not that high, but the risk always exists because of the fact that flights come in and out from Manila, which is like, I don't know, like a center for all these new variants. Yeah, but on the other hand, again, you have places like New Zealand, which they're, they're just 100% going like, okay, lockdown time, and no one there is going like, yeah, but we have to balance health and you know, the economy, because, and I read the hot take on Twitter, which I don't really think is a hot take because I really like it, actually. Uh, they said the reason why it was so easy for them to go into a lockdown and not really care about this trade-off is because they recognize that it's a false dichotomy. It's a false choice, basically, where you shouldn't have to choose between the economy and health because those things are actually the same thing. Like, it is only through a healthy population that you can get a good economy. Mm, that's fair. I feel like the New Zealand case might be an outlier. Like, it's what everyone strives to be, right? It's it's literally COVID goals. COVID goals. <laughs> but we, we can't achieve that. I feel like at this point, sadly, as Filipinos, we just kind of have to wait and see, right? The best we can do is keep ourselves updated. I've kept myself updated through researching for this episode. Um, Kyle's with me on this with researching as well. And hopefully by listening to this episode, you've learned a lot. We don't, we are not expecting you, for example, to go against the government or do something, right? Don't and, go against the government. Yeah, we're, we're not Don't allowed, break laws. <laughs> we're, we're not encouraging anything. But we want you to keep yourself updated. 
We want you to reconsider whether or not you want to get a vaccine if you're hesitant about it. We really, really encourage you to get one, especially with new variants coming out. Be safe. Wear your mask. A lot of people are saying double your mask. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of the face shields, but, you know, follow the law. There might be benefits to it. I'm not sure. But, you know, like just... But don't use the air purifier stuff. Like, it, it doesn't work. You, you Have you heard that news? Nope. Like, the, there's like air purifier necklaces that people are recommended to wear. Like, taxi drivers are being told to wear it. But, you know, anyway, that's another issue for another time. So hopefully this episode was insightful. I hope it was a good update to the last time we did this episode. And that's it. We'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.